Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Brandy Nalani McDougall, the author of poetry books The Salt Wind, Kamakani Paakai, and Aina Hanau Birthland, author of Finding Meaning, Kaona, and Contemporary Hawaiian Literature, and co-editor of Hui Hui, Navigating Art and Literature in the Pacific. A former Mellon and Ford postdoctoral fellow, she is the recipient of several awards, including the 2017 Beatrice Medicine Award for Scholarship in American Indian Studies and a Kapalapala Po'okela Honorable Mention. She is our Hawaii State Poet Laureate for 2023 to 2025, and she teaches at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Brandy Nalani McDougall talks about her role personal and cultural trauma plays in driving creative expression, a strong literary community in Hawaii, her tenure as Hawaii's Poet Laureate, and how there is usually a poet in every family. Join us in a space for creativity. Welcome to the Reading Room. Living in Hawaii, you know, you have a lot of situations and stories, you know, based on um, our setting here, right? Yeah. Um, if you were to describe your work, um, what do you write about? Oh, goodness. Um, I think among the things that I tend to write about um, happen to be very focused on um, issues that I've been trying to work out in my life and throughout my life. And so those have included, you know, what does it mean to work through um, childhood trauma? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to live as a survivor of that trauma? Also, I've been really focused on, you know, as part of that, uh, thinking through healing mm -hmm. and, um, the role that poetry can play within that. So I include actually very kind of like personal and maybe family trauma, but also colonial trauma that's a part of our history here in Hawaii. So as a Kanaka Uivi woman, a big part of my own healing process is also looking at the history of this paiaina that we live on, right? And so a lot of the environmental issues that we face can be traced to um, American colonialism and colonial projects that are ongoing, right? Including militarization, including um, uh, massive development, um, you know, urban development, but also kind of development of um, telescopes, uh, hotels, you know, all of these other kinds of like colonial projects um, with tourism, et cetera. Um, and then also what comes with that is the really forced and painful separation that was really put upon um, my ancestors and in part I also lived through, and we're still dealing with that now, of a separation from our language and culture. And so I feel it's really important to use poetry as a space to engage with that and to make those inward struggles, um, those inner struggles that I have been working through throughout my life also very transparent because I know that these are also struggles that many of us have in common. So I take it as a, as a kind of personal kuleana or responsibility to, um, even though it could feel very vulnerable and personal, to actually speak the truth about these things and share it. Um, throughout my time as a poet, um, I would say actually I became a poet mainly because um, I needed to be. 
if that makes sense. And that's because um, it's very true what Audre Lorde says when she says poetry is not a luxury. And what she means by that is that, yes, I think she would recognize too that poetry can seem somewhat luxurious at times, right? When we're, as you know, women of color, um, you know, we're rushing to do the zillions of things <laughs> we've been tasked with doing or, or kuleana that we've taken on, right? Um, and it, it can feel like a luxury to just carve out a space to write. But what she really meant by that, and I've thought about her essay very deeply, and I've taught her essay in classes, is that she means that Poetry is not a luxury because it's a necessity for life, especially for um, black and indigenous women and, and women of color in general to work through um, both the pain um, that we've inherited you know, from our ancestors as well as whatever pain or struggle that we face throughout our lives because inevitably we do, right? And um, poetry becomes a way to survive that. And it's absolutely necessary because there are, I believe that there are people who have not survived those traumas because they did not know poetry could be an option for them. Yeah. Yeah, I love how you mentioned about poetry as a way of healing and a, um, a way of probably unifying um, everyone because I I love your voice and oh. I love the fact that you're sharing it with the world you know through your books through your activism because I think like what you mentioned earlier uh, people need to hear it also not realize that they're alone yes yeah yeah because I, I, I a lot of people feel what you're feeling but just that feeling of not hearing yes. uh, other voices that are in unity. Absolutely. Um, it's I feel lot, like um, when, you're, when you're working through a lot of trauma, it is a very, it feels very isolating. And what can be so important is that sense of like someone else understands yeah. <laughs> or someone else has been through this too or is going through it. Mm -hmm. And so if that, um, if that is able if my poetry is able to do that for somebody, I feel that's the greatest um, gift, you know, um, f for me, actually, um, that uh, it, it means that whatever struggle I have had and, you know, has created the poem or the poems um, by virtue of it, it shows me that then the poem has become a space for um, someone else to receive it and then feel that they aren't alone. Yeah, absolutely. I think too, another element to why poetry is so such an important intervention within this and such an important healing tool is that when you're working through a lot of trauma, there are ways in which it's not only isolating um, because you f might feel alone, but also isolating by virtue of the ways in which, um, you know, we live in a patriarchal society that's part of the colonial experience um, here. And um, patriarchal society, a racist society, a society that's really built on so many um, inequalities um, that, you know, really silence people who don't conform to um, what is perceived to be a productive, um, uh, intelligent, you know, member of society. So that there are ways in which so many of us are discounted from that um, by very, for very superficial reasons, right? So I'm even thinking, you know, I'm thinking of people, um, you know, like, <laughs> so many groups, right? So many, like, and we actually comprise the vast majority, <laughs> right? Um, all of us, all of us marginalized people, right? And some of us multiply marginalized by virtue of our intersectionality, right? Um, of being, um, 
a woman, of being a woman of color, of being, um, um, of having a disability of some kind, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, right? Um, so there's such an intense silencing kind of built around um, when you're marginalized. And so poetry becomes this really beautiful tool where you're able to kind of speak out against that silencing, right? Um, and maybe it exists on the page, you know, but there's also really a lot of power when you're able to just sort of speak it and perform it at yeah. the same time too, yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, everything that you said. And I, I know others appreciate also that as Poet Laureate, you are giving, uh, you're listening to all of these other voices as well, and you're basically giving these voices, um, you're allowing these other voices to be heard um, on a global scale, you know. So I, I really uh, appreciate, you know, what you're doing in terms of um, uplifting and letting these voices be heard as well. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, I know you're a a lot of people are influenced by your words. Uh, are there any authors or any events that influence uh, your writing? Oh, definitely. So many. <laughs> um, you mentioned that I, you know, I, I um, try to create spaces for, you know, other writers to shine. Um, but it's really because I'm such huge fans of so many of their work, and yours included, oh. of course. And I just love, I love our poetry community here in Hawaii. It's so diverse, and there's so many ways in which there's so many different voices, um, and diverse in terms of generation, in terms of ethnicity, community, um, language. I mean, it's, diverse in any every particular way you know um and i i love that i love that and i feel like you know here in hawaii we're really lucky to have that because i feel we are we are a huge community that loves stories and we love poetry in particular like we love to use poetry as the language by which to share stories, you know? Um, and again, I think it does come from that, like poetry is not a luxury, because it's also one of the things that Audre Lord speaks about is that it poetry is perfect because it allows you to kind of steal away like small moments that you have in your day. Like maybe there's something that you really want to write about or a story you need to write down or something that your father told you that you want to make sure is memorialized for your children or, um, or something you heard um, about your grandmother or your great grandmother, you know? So it becomes these moments where you just want to capture it, right? And I think so many in Hawaii do feel that need to record that because of how close we are to our ohana, right? And how close we are within our communities, right? There's still, I think, this really beautiful island sense of sharing with each other, you know, your mango tree has plenty mango <laughs> this season you're gonna share with all of your neighbors. You're not only thinking about, oh, I'm gonna go take it to swap meat to sell or whatever, right? Like your, your immediate, your immediate, um, you immediately just wanna share that. Same with like lychee, like whatever, right? Um, and then you feel good about it too, you know? You're, you understand that within an island space, those kinds of relationships are really important, but they're always mediated by stories. And I would say poetry, they really are too. So I would, I have said um, before, and I, I believe it's really true, and you can tell me if you believe it too. I feel like there is a poet in every household in Hawaii. It's just, I mean, I don't want to sound lame and be like, they're a poet, but they didn't know it, you know, <laughs> but, but they kind of are, you know, they're the, there's, I think everyone has one, at least one in their ohana, um, who will just share these amazing insights. Maybe they're giving the prayer, you know, before dinner, you know, or something like that, or maybe, um, 
you know, they're telling a story that they grew up hearing, you know, and it comes out. Or, you know, or a child who just naturally is kind of more dramatic or acting out stories or likes to sing songs or create songs. There's ways in which there's always at least one in every ohana because it's so important, yeah. Wow, I, I, I love that, you know, that there's one in every ohana, you know, it's just, yeah. But to answer your question about specific poets, okay. Sure, yes, um, yes. I realized I didn't answer that. Haunani <laughs> um, K. Trask, of course, um, who was one of my mentors, her work has been just so inspirational to me. Um, and. Um, so brave. It's been a really important political model, especially for me to follow, but it's also, her work is also um, very searing in its emotionality as well. Um, Albert Wendt, of course, too, who is also another mentor of mine. Um, Alison Adele Hedgecoke, um, a poet who um, I'm very uh, happy to call a friend um, these days as well. And her work um, really focused on such important environmental issues, um, changes that she's seen during her lifetime and during the lifetime of, of her father and generations past, um, uh, mainly on Turtle Island or uh, North America. but. You know, her work has been really important to me to look at, like, issues related to Aina and environmentalism and, and really kind of pay attention to that. Um, Al's work has been so important for me to kind of look at family dynamics, how to tell family stories as well, because so much of his, his work, whether it's his novels, his play, his, um, you know, his novel written in verse, his poetry, and, and his artwork is, you know, um, Pacific culture, or centering Pacific culture, but also within this space of, you know, what's happening within the family, what's happening within, um, within the community. You know, who are these characters and how are they coming together and, and sort of capturing all that. Yeah, all of that wow. together. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. I was wondering, you have so many poems and so many books. I was wondering, do you have a favorite or, and if so, what is your favorite um, poem or book? Um, that, um, that I've read or oh, that oh, I've that, written? That you've written. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I have a, um, a favorite book that I've written, but um, my latest book just came out last year and probably best represents just by virtue of it coming out last year, represents where I've been at most recently. So there was a wide gap between my two poetry books. My first book, The Salt Wind, Kamakani Paakai, came out in 2008 and then um, my second book, Aina Hanau, Birthland, came out in um, 2023. So there's a 15 year <laughs> kind of space between them. And then in the middle, um, actually not quite, maybe, actually maybe it's a kind of in the middle. Um, in 2016 um, is when I wrote um, Finding Meaning, uh, Kauna in Contemporary Hawaiian Literature, which is my um, critical um, book, a critical monograph, which looks at um, kauna, or the practice of hiding and finding meaning in contemporary Hawaiian literature. So how, as a practice, that has continued um, across time, despite American colonialism and despite um, the imposition of English um, a, a, on many of us as Hawaiian writers. So being able to write or include kauna in our work that um, being able to do that despite having to write in English um, mm -hmm. I think was really important for me to kind of convey in that practice and that writing practice as a contemporary Hawaiian writer. Um, 
But yeah, it's hard for me to choose one. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, a favorite, and that's hard. <laughs> I feel like they each represented different aspects of my life at the time. And so f I'm really grateful to, to all of them yeah. um, because I don't know if you feel this way about poetry. I'm sure you probably do. Um, you know, poetry becomes a way to release things, to let them go a little bit. And it doesn't mean you, you completely let them go or then you forget about them, <laughs> you know, of course. But like they, each poem becomes a kind of vessel to hold something for you, whether it's a memory, whether, uh, or whether it's a memory and emotion attached to it, whether it's uh, a story you heard. But it, it's obviously something, for me at least, that needed to get out, needed to find its way out. And so each book kind of has these moments in time for me um, and, and holds that for me, perhaps when I might need them, you know. And it'll be surprising sometimes when I'm reading something where I feel as though the poem has released it from me, but as soon as I'm reading it out loud, it, it brings it back, like I'm back there with it, you know, and it can be surprising even to feel the same emotions that it was holding. Yeah. yeah. Have you have you yeah, felt that I, I before felt, in your yeah. own work? Oh yeah, and I, I know like when we were together, yeah. <laughs> for yeah. the, the pigeon poetry, it's like yes. it, it it gets emotional. It you does, know? especially like I know notice you mentioned how important language is. Yes, and you know especially with pigeon or you know a, any kind of language, it, it there's a lot of politics also involved with right. language and identity and right. culture w right. with language. So yeah, I, I totally understand, I agree with, and that's such a good point where it does bring an emotion. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a center in that poem yeah. that has that yeah. strong emotion and then you just get right back to it when yeah. you, when you yeah, read yeah, it. it brings yeah. you back to it. But I think, I always feel like that's a really good sign too. It shows that that poem really held something really authentic from you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was it was a poem that like you weren't necessarily trying too hard or trying to be something that you're not yeah. or you know or trying something fancy or yeah. you know, it was a poem that that just held something real mm. for you and yeah. and it was said how it was supposed to be said or written how it was supposed to be written. Yeah. yeah I, I love how you mentioned uh, 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 authenticity, you know, so I mean, uh, being authentic yeah, <laughs> in yeah. your work. Um, I know in your work you write in standard English, but also Olelo Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And was there, um, how do you keep that authenticity in your work? Um, so I feel I've been really lucky to be able to draw from, you know, many um, ancestral heritages, and uh, with that has come, you know, different languages. Um, I feel like the a sense of authenticity, it can include like which language you're writing in, right? But I think how, how that ends up manifesting in the authenticity of feeling within a poem is often, um, often comes through how you're being honest in choosing a specific language to represent whatever that emotionality is or whatever that issue is. So, you know, I, I, have, a, I have a few poems, a, very, a lot fewer in number, um, at least right now, um, fewer poems in Pigeon, though very strongly every now and then there will be a very strong and prominent Pigeon voice that comes out, you know, and I'm like, this needs to be in Pigeon, and so that'll come out. Um, but yes, I think because I, maybe from my job, um, maybe it's also partly like the trauma of my family in trying to reinforce like a standard English, um, you know, as many of our families did, right, um, at home. Um, and then, couple that with, you know, being Kanako Ivi, 
that emphasis on um, you know incorporating standard English um, amongst children you know and correcting pidgin was also really familiar because um, you know as my grandparents generation was the generation that that was first really silenced from speaking um, Olalo Hawaii, right? And so they had experienced in their lifetime like two modes of silencing, you know, that they had also been conditioned to. So, you know, they grew up without, with their parents not speaking Hawaiian to them, even though that was the main language during their parents during my great-grandparents lifetime that was the language of Hawaii everyone spoke Olala Hawaii you know living here right all communities did and actually um, um, you know Larry Kimura um, has shared and has emphasized how pidgin is built upon the structure of the Hawaiian language um, and not it's not actually broken English. It has just incor it incorporated enough English to survive. So it gives the idea that pidgin is broken English, but really it's that was there as a protective measure so people could still communicate. But the underlying structure, the foundation is Ola Lo Hawaii, which is really interesting. Um, and then, yeah, so in my grandparents' time, they had experienced that. And then later, um, in their grandchild, grandchildren's time, um, you know, there was also the censorship of pigeon that was there. So that was a part of their experience, and they had also experienced, I think, a sense of threat and danger on what would happen if you speak anything but standard English. So they had already kind of incorporated a lot of that, um, you know, into their own makeup and well-being, and that was something that we were then taught, right? But of course, it didn't, it didn't take too long for me to want to push back against that. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if it's, it's Sagittarius energy in me, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've always, from, from a very young age, wanted to push back against people who said I couldn't do something, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that, that actually provided extra motivation <laughs> for me. Um, so, so yeah, um, and, and even if it's coming lovingly, you know, from, from family, there was always still a little bit like, well, I'm going to try to do my own thing, you know. Thus, I became a poet, too. <laughs> right. I, I love it. <laughs> um, if you don't mind, would you, could you read some of oh, your yes, work? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, I have... Um, in thinking about what I'd like to read today, mm -hmm. I felt especially called to share um, a couple of sonnets from this one uh, series that I wrote, and it's called Ka'olalo. It's a poem that I wrote, and I'm thinking about learning Olalo Hawaii with my grandfather and what it meant to kind of to reconnect with Olalo and what it meant to reconnect with him by virtue of that too. So, okay. So this is Ka Olalo and there's an epigraph that is in Olalo no Iao and it goes, O ke alalo ka hoi uli, o ka olalo a kawaha. The tongue is the steering paddle of the words uttered by the mouth. Think of all the lost words still unspoken, waiting to be given use again, claimed, or for newly born words to unburden them of their meanings. There are winds and rains who have lost their names, descending the slopes of every mountain, each lush valley's mouth. And the songs of birds and mo'o that cope with our years of slow, unknowing somehow. It was not long ago that Olalo was silenced, along with its dying race, who lived then thrived, reverting to the old knowing words. English could never replace the land's unfolding song, nor the ocean's ancient oli giving us use again. 
Like the sea urchin leaves, pimpling its shell as its many spines let go, turned to sand. My great-grandfather's Hawaiian words fell silent. While his children grew, their skin tanned and too thin to withstand the teacher's stick. Reprimands demanding English only. The law lasted until 1986, after three generations of family swallowed our olelo like pohaku, learned to live with the cold, dark fruit under our tongues. This is our legacy. Words strewn among vana spines and the long record the sand has kept within its grains, closer to reclaiming our shells, now grown thicker. Beautiful. Mahalo. I know it's, it's so it's so sad, you know, so all of the the loss of the language, and I'm so glad that you you wrote about it, and many people can relate. And yeah, yeah, I think I think though it's it's interesting because you know um, there is a there is a place for struggle um, and trauma that enables you to become stronger right and I think I think about all of the ways in which um, you know so many of us have had to struggle mm -hmm. under American colonialism and it's many debilitating projects mm -hmm. right but I think there's there are also ways in which that struggle teaches us what's important, mm -hmm. what is true wealth, yeah. what's true vai vai, you know, and then what also is um, what we shouldn't take for granted, in other words. So it's only through something being threatened, taken away from you, that you understand how important it is, how important it is to you and your community and to the land that we live in, you know, the land that we live on. And it's through that struggle that then you're able to see that's what we need to fight for, yeah. right? That's what we need to value. And um, it helps guide you in these ways that I think are so important. Right, and I think there are ways in which, you know, maybe even by virtue of being or facing that struggle, face, facing a kind of brokenness, right, that when when you work, um, whether alone or within a community within your ohana, to overcome that you emerge from it even stronger, mm. you know? So I'm really just encouraged by, like I wrote that particular poem, um, you know, maybe, gosh, uh, a couple decades ago now. <laughs> and um, because I wrote it, of course, before the book was published, right? And it was when I was really just beginning my journey of, of being, um, reconnecting with Olalo Hawaii. So I just started kind of enrolling in Olalo Hawaii classes at UH, um, found such an amazing community of Olalo Hawaii speakers and advocates there. It was amazing. Um, that then like mooshed into, you know, discussions with my Ohana um, who also wanted to reconnect. And it was really exciting, you know, and then, um, to now where I'm really happy, you know, um, one of my daughters is going to um, um, uh, Kukula Kayapunio Anui Nui in Palolo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shout out to Anui Nui <laughs> um, and all the Kumu and, and awesome folks there. Um, and, you know, she gets to be in a Hawaiian immersion program and she gets to understand how beautiful, mm. you know, our Olalo Hawaii is, and she is being raised with that, um, you know, and I can see it in her confidence, I can see it in the knowledge that she has, and in her 
um, belief in herself and in our ancestors. And that's so beautiful to yeah. see, you know. And I think, you know, it's only, gro it's only going to be growing from there. Yeah. yeah. I, I love all, everything that you're mentioning about the revitalization of, of culture and language. And, and, you know, hopefully there will be a time where, you know, we just kind of look at the history books and, you know, say, oh, that's what happened, you know, because I, I think, yeah, right now, it, you know, as we all know, it, it's still a struggle. And, you know, every word that you write, every, you know, expression that you include, it's, it helps not only to inform, but also to unify um, people. Um, I know you have a lot of personal um, experiences that you share. Um, I was wondering, and this is a question I ask everyone, is there something that you would not write about or a topic mm. that's like not um, something that you would engage in? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's really important, especially if I'm telling if I'm sharing a story that someone else has shared with me, to seek their permission first, of course. So, um, and that would include family members, so even things that, let's say, I experienced with someone else, if they, if a family member, friend, um, or acquaintance, um, you know, doesn't want me to share that, then I won't. And I, I've always felt it really important and this is just um, this is just my own practice right I don't necessarily think you know I don't I don't judge other writers who don't necessarily <laughs> do that in other words yeah. but this is this is what I think should be in place um, you know if you are if you're truly you know if you're if you're dedicated to um, to uplifting a community. I think it is important to respect the ways in which um, some stories just shouldn't be told mm -hmm. or some yeah. knowledge shouldn't be shared. Yeah. Um, I think a big part of that is, you know, being raised in a Hawaiian household within Hawaiian culture. It's not like we're keeping secrets or anything, but there are, I mean, in some cases we are, of course, but, but I think there are, um, there's an idea within our culture, and I think within many cultures, that in order to arrive at a particular place, you need to earn the ex and, and, and live through the experiences in order to get to that place. Like there shouldn't be a shortcut, in other words, yeah. right? So some stories, some knowledge needs to be earned. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's through a really close friendship or through community, right? Um, or by virtue of you demonstrating that you can understand and relate to it, right? And that's not always the case. So there's, you know, I think um, at a recent workshop that I did with the amazing Lee Tonouchi, you know, there was a question, for example, that came up about um, writing in pidgin if you're not if you haven't been raised as a pidgin speaker and so one of the things I shared was that well you know um, I don't I don't feel comfortable telling another writer what to do and what you should what you should do what you should do mm -hmm. and things like that because I think everybody needs to make those decisions for themselves but at the same time they need to be responsible for those decisions, right? Um, and I did say, with a word of caution, like whenever you're writing um, about a community that maybe you're re recently a part of, or maybe you aren't a part of, even though you admire them, you know, um, you, you need to be sure that you're writing from a space of love because if you're not, <laughs> and this is my, this is my cautionary tale, sure, right? sure. if you're not, mm. that's going to be very transparent yeah. and that community yeah. will feel that. Mm. And whether or not you're actually confronted about it, you know, that community will feel it. Mm. And so you have to make that decision because mm. it's going to come out no matter what. Like there, I think there's a, writing is a really transparent thing, right? So 
even things like the ugly parts of us that we try to hide, I think, and all of us have that, right? I think writing can make some of that transparent. So you have to be, you have to really think about, you have to really think about what you're writing <laughs> <laughs> in that way. And then you have that responsibility that comes with it. Right. Yeah, I love that, the responsibility <clears throat> and respect, yes. right, for, yes. you know, um, is this something you should write or, you know, do you have the background um, and respect right. to honestly write about it? Yes, yeah. Awesome. And is it coming from the space of love, mm -hmm. right? I Good think point. that's also, like, um, love, and that doesn't necessarily mean, like, okay, you, can, you should only <laughs> write about people that you only have good things about, like only good experiences, only positive everything about them. Um, but like love in the sense of like, I see their humanness. Mm -hmm. I see them as, a, as another life that's, that's deserving of love, you know? Um, and there are these amazing things about them. And it doesn't have to be all amazing, again. But I see these amazing things about them that I want to also capture, you know, in that, in, you know, in all of their complexities, mm. right? Yeah, I, I love how you mentioned, like, just, it, it is complex, right? Um, I was wondering, well, what is your writing process when you write a poem oh, and how, yes. what, what process do you go through? <laughs> oh, okay. I usually start with a free writing with, with a bunch of free writing. And usually I try to actually um, have it be timed free writing because um, that's all I can <laughs> really manage sometimes. And I think this also works really well for people who are experiencing writer's block because it's also mm -hmm. something I oh, struggle yeah, with. Yeah. Um, because if you're waiting for inspiration, you're gonna be waiting for a long time often, <laughs> right? <laughs> And maybe that worked for you at a different point in time when you felt inspired by everything. But sometimes there are days when you're, when you're just tired and your, your brain feels like mush and <laughs> you, you're, you've had to be in a bunch of meetings and you've had all these strange conversations or interesting discussions um, that feel really unrelated to then now having to do this work and you're viewing it as work of writing poetry or writing a poem. And for me, it, off, it, it can often come with like a deadline attached to it. Like I have to write a poem about this or, or it might even be just some strange um, anxious uh, deadline I've put on myself. Like, oh, like I used to get, <laughs> I don't know if you can relate to this. I used to get this, these anxious moments. Um, I still get them a lot of the time where I feel like, oh, I haven't written a poem in months now. Oh no, like I, maybe I don't know how to do it anymore. And oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? And oh, can I really call myself a poet? Like I'm having this existential crisis and <laughs> creative crisis all mixed into one. But um, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like what I'm able to do and kind of working through that are these timed free writing, automatic writing exercises. So basically I'll set a timer for um, five minutes usually, just something really small. I'm like, okay, you can do five minutes, okay? And um, in that time, you know, taking out my journal, a notebook, or sometimes if I just have my laptop, um, then just typing whatever comes into my mind and trying to make it judgment free as I'm writing it. So that's what automatic writing is. Um, it's intended to really get into more of your subconscious. So maybe at first you're even writing things like, I don't know what to write. I can't believe this person said that at this meeting and blah, blah, you know, like you're, you're <laughs> yeah. still, you're getting rid of all the all the junk that's rattling around in there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but then it reaches a point, because the five minutes are still going, <laughs> that you're like, oh, and then like an idea will, will, will come, and then you just follow it. So um, at least that's how it's worked for me, is that there'll be surprising things that come out once I've um, 
gotten rid of a lot of the junk that was in there, you yeah. know, but like the five minutes are still going and then, and then um, the five minutes are up and usually at the end of that, if I'll have something maybe to work with. Um, so I might do, and if, but if I don't, I also am like, it's okay. You just needed, a, you need to clear out a lot more junk. You need to declutter a lot more. So do another five minutes, you know, and, and keep going. And I think if you do that enough, you'll find different uh, pieces to kind of work with or, or moments that will, will draw you in. Mm -hmm. At least that's how it's worked for me. Wow. Um, and so that's usually my process and then I follow through with that. Because usually I have an idea of something I want to write about and so I'll try it. But sometimes that poem doesn't want to come out just yet, mm -hmm. but another one will pop in by virtue of that automatic writing exercise. So I try not to put limits on like, no, you only need to write about this, you only need to write about that. Mm -hmm. um, I try to have it be open mm -hmm. to whatever might be there and then, um, yeah, see what can emerge from there. Yeah, yeah. that's, I, I love your, your process. I was wondering, like, there's a lot of historical events as well in your work. Yes. Um, and we, we talked about authenticity in language, um, but also there's authenticity um, in, uh, well, when you do your research, you know, yes. for, so, so well, what steps do you follow when, when researching something that you're passionate about and, you know, yes. um, respectfully um, uh, representing it? On yes. the page. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I go. I. I mean, I. I really love those moments because I. I mean, I love nerding out. I just love. I love nerding out. So um, I. And I can get really lost in like a research phase mm -hmm. because it's about reading, um, history, reading stories, um, I, and I get immersed in thinking about, you know. Um, you know, smaller details, perhaps. Um, yeah. Um, in a lot of the workshops um, I lead as Poet Laureate, another element in addition to healing, and I, it's related, is um, really kind of emphasizing um, Ike Aina, or a knowledge of the land that we're on. And so part of that might entail sharing Olalo no Eau, or um, it always entails sharing um, the Inoa Aina of that, of that particular place, the place name, and what it means, and the ways in which I, I try to develop a, a creative writing exercise that also draws from that in some way, you know, um, so that people can feel um, more connected to the land that we're on and feel that that's also going to provide, you know, a sense of inspiration. But I can get really lost in, in the weeds sometimes <laughs> of, of research. But I think that's also important. I think you want to get it right, mm -hmm. you know, and you want to feel as though you've really looked at, looked at it from multiple angles, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, kind of a Hawaiian philosophical or even like methodological mm -hmm. approach is um, makavalu, which is approaching something. Makavalu literally means eight eyes, but um, the idea of it as a kind of method methodology is that you um, approach things by virtue of thinking through multiple perspectives of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So imagining it from different viewpoints, perhaps, um, looking at it, what does this particular historical event look like from the Inus perspective, for example? What happened, you know, in this history? What might um, this person have been feeling at the time that isn't covered in just these basic events that were given. Because often, you know, when we read um, a historical text, they aren't really going into the internal, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's also a really interesting, I mean, unless there are journals available mm -hmm. where, but even then, even so, you know, I think for many, um, Many folks, we don't always, we don't always write everything in our journal, everything that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. So there's still, 
I spend a lot of time aside from the research then also thinking through how would I feel living in this time, mm. living through this event, living through this moment? Like, how did my ancestors feel? You know, um, what decisions would I make by virtue of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, knowing that I would share the same values of loving my ohana, mm -hmm. you know, wanting the best for my daughters, you know, yeah. um, you know, loving Aina, mm -hmm. you know, what. How would I feel in that moment? What decisions would I make? What would I be thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so I think, like approaching history mm -hmm. with a with a really strong sense of empathy is also mm -hmm. really important too. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> much for for sharing. You know, your process, even when it's um, in regards to research, and also you know your mission as poet laureate, and you know you've been so impactful in terms of like sharing not only the work of others but encouraging others to write as well and i know a lot of times beginning authors they they want to know like you know they want advice of like how to how to be a, a writer but yeah. also like how do i get published like either yeah. book publication or in yeah. a journal like do you have any um, advice for uh writers on um about writing or in publishing sure um I think, you know, publishing, writing, yes, do it, do it, just do it. Um, I think if, if poetry is something that is, that is grabbing you and you feel, you feel you've heard the calling and you're answering it, um, and it really is a particular calling, right? I think um, many of us have heard the calling and have decided, no, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> or some of us hear the calling and we follow it for some time and then we take a break and then we come back, you know. Um, but if you are um, a poet just starting off, a writer just starting off, I would approach it from the standpoint of looking, of really paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. Paying attention to how this is something you feel really strongly about and sticking with it. You know, read and read widely and find um, other poets mm. that you'd like to read and fi figure out who your favorite poets are, mm. you know, um, take poetry classes, uh, also um, find um, local publications first, right? So that could even be a lot of, um, you know, at the um, college level, um, but even like high school, middle school, there's going to be publications that you have at your different, um, like, uh, at different schools that you're a part of, depending upon how old you are, you know, there's gonna be opportunities for you to share your work. Maybe it's with your teacher initially, and then, and then um, that could kind of go into something else, right? Um, maybe there'll be opportunities for you to read your work and just take those. Like, don't be scared of doing that. I say just like, just kind of push yourself into the excitement, not the anxiety, the excitement of using your work to connect with others, you know, to connect with other writers and to connect with um, other community, to connect with um, other, other people like yourselves, you know, um, because that's where you, you end up finding your people. Mm, <laughs> that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I think of it like, you know, like with, um, with birds and bird calls. So many bird calls and bird songs are there to find where the other, where the other birds are at, yeah, right? Where's true. the rest of the community? Mm -hmm. And a poem can function really similarly, right? It's like, this is my poem and it's about this. And then see how it connects, because I think that really is what poetry is supposed to be about. It's about connection, oh, I, right? Yeah. And so, find that way to connect you know and you also get really great feedback you know as you grow as a writer too and be open to it even though feedback can be hard if it's not just all praise <laughs> right but um you know it's all you learn um who can help you mm -hmm. in your writing yeah. and you learn um you learn what you need to know by virtue of that, if that makes sense. So um, 
you know, but but try to be open mm. through that process of growing and everything. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So read widely, take classes, just go out there be a part of our amazing poetry community because you're going to find it so nurturing too like I feel yeah. like our yeah. Hawaii poetry community is really great in that yeah. way like people are there and ready to be like yes write poetry do it it's so great you know um, like once you find other poets like that's the energy right which is so beautiful mm -hmm. to see um, yeah and pay attention to that and keep going because yeah. we need we need your stories yeah <laughs> good. And, and speaking of stories and the community, uh, if you don't mind reading uh, one more poem. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read from uh, my latest collection, Aina Hanau, Birthland. Um, okay. I didn't, I, pr on purpose, I did not plan which poem I was oh. going to read because oh. I was going to feel the vibe. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what I should read. Oh, um, sure. Uh, so let me, I'm going to read a couple. Oh, okay. But, sure. but one is very short. Okay, sure. And then the other is one that's specific to the Aina that we're on. Oh, okay. Um, because okay. we're, we're very close. Uh, we were right by Pu'uloa, mm -hmm. um, where we're on, yeah, sure. the coast of Pu'uloa. Um, so, Okay, so the first one I'm going to read, and this is the very short one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is because of the, of the time that we're living in where we still have rim pack exercises happening, yeah. and they're going to be um, happening this summer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they happen every two years. Um, these are basically, um, you know, war game exercises um, that are opened up on our oceans here in Hawaii um, to many countries who are allied with the United States um, or those countries who are perhaps not allied, their attentions, but um, they are invited mm -hmm. to demonstrate their weapons, um, their, their weapons of war on our oceans. So there, there is so much just really horrific damage that comes with RIMPAC um, being here every two years. So this is from a poem that was a collaborative poem with poets of Aotearoa. Um, the Federated States of Micronesia, Guahan, and Hawaii. So all of us as Pacific peoples speaking out against RIMPAC. And um, so this was my part in it, which is a shorter one. Okay. In a world without RIMPAC, there is breath enough to stand against the torpedoing teeth, the amphibious assaults, underwater explosions, the nuclear bombs and billions of dollars and bullets of peacetime that continue elsewhere. Breath enough to solve these and so many wounds, to sing so loud we drown all submarine sonar. So that was just, that was my part. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, um, I encourage you, um, if you'd like to hear the rest of the, or if anyone would like to sure. hear the rest of it, you could actually um, do a search on U YouTube for um, the Cancel Rimpack Coalition oh. poem, and you mm -hmm. can hear the full poem, the full collaborative poem it's in its entirety. Um, and then the second poem I'm going to read is called Pu'uloa. Mm -hmm. And this was, um, you know, a little bit before our interview, I had shared that I used to live in Aiea with mm -hmm. my ohana, and we could, like, we were so close to the Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. um, base that we could be woken up mm -hmm. at 8 a.m. with the Star Spangled Banner every day, mm -hmm. right? Um, we were up before that, but <laughs> but on weekends when you even wanted, when you wanted to sleep in, no, you know. So um, for a long time, um, I don't know if you're like it, I'm, I'm sure you could relate to this too. And um, you whatever 
sound you hear mm -hmm. that's supposed to be your alarm that wakes you up in the morning, yeah. mm -hmm. you just naturally grow to hate it, right? <laughs> like yeah. you're just like, oh, go on. Yeah. Like, and then you hear, like I wake up oh. too, I try to choose songs that are like happy songs, yeah. so I wake up happy, but then inevitably, <laughs> I grow to like not yeah. like those songs <laughs> True. because they've woken me up. Well, okay, I already had, um, I already felt and had issues mm -hmm. um, with the Star Spangled Banner, yeah. of course, because mm -hmm. of American colonialism, um, American occupation, and you know, the illegitimacy of the annexation of Hawaii, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so many other things, right? All of the ways in which um, uh, all of us in Hawaii and these beautiful islands that we're a part of are really exploited um, for American profit, right? And so um, this poem is called Pu'uloa, and it's thinking through what is it? What did it mean to have that danger of militarization like so close by? Because even though it's it's emphasized that U.S. militarization is supposed to protect us and keep us secure, it really doesn't. For for those of us who live near where they do live fire training, um, or even just hearing about it, like that doesn't make you feel safe. Um, when you think about the rates of violence that come with um, military um, service members um, participating in and maybe even inflicting some of that violence, that's also um, a part of it. Um, not to mention, of course, recent issues with like contamination and fuel with Red Hill, but um, so much other like environmental damage that has come with U.S. militarization, which um, the U.S. military I believe I've heard statistics of it being amongst the the largest polluters mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, in the world. So this is uh, Pu'uloa. Outside our home, pregnant sprawl of American war and selective memory, protrusion of concrete roadway, white bar hovering over the rusted wrecks of turrets, barnold oil bunkers, torpedo blisters. Local Amano drained, filled to build the naval yard. Docked battleships in service, Moku Ume Ume enclosed, metal earth mover claws, hooks ever ready to ravage Avalao under the great white eyeball of PATCOM. Sure enough, there are tourists there too, snapping like starved triggerfish. White uniformed naval guides might be telling them how the USS Arizona was a 608 foot super dreadnought that now entombs 942 men. They might salute the dead soldiers and ask for a moment of silence. They will not say the ship has been leaking two to nine quarts of oil every day for the past 75 years. Or that since World War II, the military has stored its toxic waste in the harbor where it has leaked into, under, into groundwater wells. Or that bunker fuel and other petroleum waste have been leaking from a tank farm into a 20-acre underground plume of 5 million gallons. Or that mercury is in the soil. Or that pesticides, dry cleaning fluids, and metal residues from the open burning of ordinances are in the soil, or that asbestos scrap, polychlorinated by phenols, paints and solvents are in the soil, or tetrachloroethane and hydrocarbons in storm drains, or that there are 700 documented areas of contamination at Pearl Harbor, or that in IAEA, where we are close enough to hear their 8 a.m. Star Spangled Banner blare, our people are walking our children are playing. We are bathing and drinking. We are driving and listening to NPR reports on defense spending. We are watching reruns or DVR recordings of NCIS on TV. We are eating and sleeping and breathing and dying. And when they end the moment of silence for soldier sacrifice, they will salute their flag over Pu'uloa and her monstrous womb. Yeah. 
Oh, wow, that was <laughs> strong. Thank you so much for, for reading. And, and, you know, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I know we knew each other way back in the day. And, <laughs> yes. you know, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for helping me in the beginning, you know, with my first Aww. book. And I know you've been helping. Your first so book is beautiful. <laughs> you needed very oh, little help. And, no, like, it was, but, yeah. But, you know, you helped so many uh, new writers, you know, from the very beginning. And, you know, on, on behalf of... Oh, a lot of the writers you helped and including me you know thank you so much for all that you're currently doing and all that you've done um, to help get literature out there and um, yes. have all different um, uh, people have uh, representation you know so so thanks for I all you do that. <laughs> mahalo one thing you actually just reminded me and i wanted to share this because oh. of because of our history oh. and our friendship with yeah. each other um so um, folks may or may not know, Anne and I started a press together when we were um, at UH as graduate students. Oh. And that press, um, we called it Kahua Omanoa Press, mm -hmm. right? And it came about because as writers, as poets, we didn't see the, that there were any, like very many opportunities mm -hmm. The, the opportunities that were available were so limited in terms of publishing collections of poetry, yet there were so many of us that had these collections of poetry and it just felt really wrong for them to then sit in some like, I don't know, just a digital library that someone had to look at that's like a thesis, you know, for, for UH. And so we started our own press. And I think that's really important to point out to, um, you know, writers, who are starting out and if they don't feel like there are spaces for them to publish or there are spaces that adequately represent who they are and the words that they would like to see out in the world, I think start your own press or get find your own ways to get it out. You don't always have to rely on the publications that are available for you. So you take it as like an opportunity to be like, no, I'm going to really honor the work that I've been doing and the communities that I represent. And I'm going to start my own thing. And I think that's really, that's also a part of our like sassy island spirit, you know, <laughs> is, is like, oh, I'm just going to do them. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah. just going to do them. Like forget, like, yeah, forget whatever, like people telling you no can. No, I'm just going to do them. Yeah, oh. I'll show you, you know. And I think that's, that's important to to remember too for writing yeah and and you know just to just to give you credit you know i, I know we uh co-founded uh that press but you're the one who's keeping it running you know you're keeping Aww. it running and i just have so much appreciation and thank you so much for all you do to lift voices thank you <laughs> And uh, thank you so much, uh, Brandy and Alani McDougall, for visiting us and sharing your knowledge in the, re in the reading room. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us for another episode of The Reading Room.